relative importance of the interests at stake in a termination of parental rights case? Well, who are the parties? The parents. What do they want? Kids. They want their kids. Um, there's the children. The children, I will tell you, need to be safe. But they may want uh, all kinds of things. Um, from my experience in doing child welfare cases, as somebody said, and I, I think this is a great quote, all our kids want to go home. Nina, right? I mean, that's what they know. These are their mom and dad. This is their block. This is their blankie. This is their bed. This is their school. This is their neighborhood. All our kids want to go home. Sometimes they change their minds later, depending on how bad it was and how good we can make it. Um, but we need them to be safe. And so that's a very important interest that may countermand the parent's wish to have the child with them. So the parent wants the kid. The kid needs to be safe. The government wants children to have parents that can keep them safe so that children don't become wards of the, the state. They don't become criminals. They don't become dead. Laws document our society's standards about what's important. So our legislature meets, and theoretically, they represent our interests, and they write laws which control everybody's behavior. So in the United States, you're not allowed to physically abuse or neglect your children. That's a law here. We have laws that say parents' rights to their children can be terminated in the best interests of the child. We have laws saying that children must be afforded safety, permanency, and well-being. But the laws don't say it all. We have a constitution. And if the constitution weighs in to the judge's decision in the courtroom, the judge has to consider that the parents have a fundamental constitutional right to raise their own child. We take that very seriously here. And there cannot be laws that allow the government to take children away from their parents willy-nilly. There has to be a substantial reason, a balancing of that interest. How do you make that balance? What procedures should the courts use? We're on to number two of the balancing test. So we have these very important rights for the kids and very important rights for the parents. What are procedures? I was talking about the things you have to do during trial. Well, here's one. Notice. In court cases, if the government wants your property, like tax collections, if they want your life, they're going to put you in jail or execute you, or they want your liberty interests, like your ability to work someplace or to raise your own child, they have to serve you with a summons and complaint that explains what they want and why they want it. And you have to get that before you go to court. So that's notice. It allows you to be prepared in court instead of surprised. So let's do this notice thing. If you are able, please rise. Stand up. Thank you. Now, those of you who are wearing anything blue, you may sit down. Only if you're wearing something blue. Can I have your attention, please? There's a new rule. You only get to sit down during this lecture if you're wearing blue. And because I want to be reasonable. Um, if you're not wearing anything blue, if you have brought me proof that you neither own anything blue nor can afford to buy any blue clothing, then you can sit down. Has anybody brought such proof? No? <laughs> Standees, I think you're thinking right now, that's not fair. I didn't know. I had to bring documents to show that I didn't own anything blue. So that's because you didn't have notice. And our government is required 
for due process to be afforded to you to give you notice. You may be seated. Parents facing a state application for custody of their children have to be told in advance why. They have to be given time to prepare and answer the allegations. Notice is a tool for justice. Without it, the likelihood of a fair result goes down considerably. Here's another one. The right to be heard. Is that bothering um, anybody? It's going to be hot in here, right? Well, it's the, the problem is if we close, it doesn't open from the outside. Oh. Okay. Yeah, just, just leave it. Thanks. If it's not bothering anybody, are we okay with the, whatever's coming through the door? Okay, never mind. Sorry, small interruption. Here's another thing that belongs to due process is the right to be heard. So most times when the government wants to take something from you, you have the opportunity to say, why that shouldn't happen. Whatever it is, your taxes, your property, your children, your liberty, not always. Sometimes there's an emergency. I know in my field with DCPNP, um, caseworkers have the right to go investigate when they have a report of child abuse or neglect. And if they find a family where the children are on the floor bleeding, they can tuck them under their arms and walk out the door. You don't have the right to be heard at that moment, but you do get the right to be heard later because that's part of due process. Um, the kind of hearing that you get, the kind of opportunity to be heard, depends on the right that's being taken away from you. In criminal cases, you get a trial by jury. Everybody knows that, right? Trial of your peers. If custody is at stake, then you get an evidentiary hearing like a trial, but you don't get a jury. There's other interests that weigh against a jury trial, although four states do allow them. What are those interests? Well, the child might be embarrassed if there's a jury and a public hearing about whether their father sexually assaulted them, right? So there are other interests at stake, and there's a balancing test about what everybody's interests are what process is due to make it fair, and where that should take us. There are some things called administrative hearings in the executive branch, where if you are denied a license to run a daycare center, you don't get a trial, but you do get to be heard by an administrative officer who's gonna listen to you say, I know I don't quite meet the conditions for a daycare center in my home, but this is what I think I can do about it, and you get to talk. And it, you know, I'm sure from personal experience, that if something is decided that works against your interests, you at least want to have said your say, right? So at least even in your rights which are smaller than child custody rights or liberty interests or going to jail, even with an issue like getting a license, you still want and have the right to be heard. You've all seen me in my fancy jacket. Now I'm going to take it off. It's quite warm. All right. So the weight of the interest involved determines how much of a hearing you have. The opportunity to be heard is a tool for justice. And without it, the likelihood of a fair result goes down considerably. If you're only here on one side, much less likely to get a fair result. What else? All right. I'm going to ask those of you who can to please stand again. All rise. The bailiff calls out. The judge is coming. Thank you. You got notice. You're at your hearing. Do you know the rules of the game? Do you know what questions I'm going to ask you? Do you know what questions your professors are going to ask you? No. Uh, who are you going to call? Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters. <laughs> Ghostbuster lawyers. Um, yeah, you, you have the right to an attorney in many cases. And 
And uh, if you would rather have an attorney answer my questions or those of your professors, you may be seated. You all want to answer my questions or you want a lawyer? Uh, lawyer. Okay. Is anybody listening to me? Okay. Some rights are so important that the government is required to pay for an attorney for you, even if you can't afford to retain one on your own. And those cases include criminal cases, and they also include cases where you could lose the right to custody of your child, whether temporarily or permanently. The right to an attorney is a tool for justice. And the likelihood of a fair outcome, if you don't have an attorney, is gravely diminished, right? Nobody wants to go to court without a lawyer, a good lawyer, preferably. One more thing, burden of proof and standard of proof. You've heard the expression, innocent until proven guilty. Do you know what that means? It means, in legal, that the government, the state, the prosecutor, has the burden of proof. The government has to say what it has against you and prove that you are guilty. You do not have to say anything in response. If the government can't show in the first instance that they have enough evidence to convict you, you can stand silent and still be declared innocent because the government has the burden of proof. In our justice system, if the government wants something from you, the government has to prove that it is entitled to take it. So here's how that works. I sue you for custody of your child. Pretend you have a child that you like and want to keep. I prove to the judge, forgive me, it's just a story, that you are a paranoid schizophrenic and you sometimes don't take your meds, or they're not strong enough, and you have delusions. And you have a school-aged child. So I'm your neighborhood DCPP <coughs> worker, like this worker, and I'm really worried, because you're paranoid schizophrenic, and sometimes you have delusions. And I'm thinking, that could be really dangerous for a school-aged child. How many of you agree? Could be dangerous. Hands? How many think? No risk here. And the rest of you think, you have to raise your hands one or the other when I ask a question. Okay. Um, I ask for custody to protect your child from whatever might happen in the madness of your household. And your lawyer says, the state should not get custody of my client's child because there's no proof that my child ever has delusions when the child is with her. There's no evidence that that ever happened. And history is the best predictor of the future. So leave my client's child with her. Leave my, ch my client's child alone. Where's even the potential for harm? The state has not proved that this child is unsafe. You win. You can win without opening your mouth because if the judge concludes that I have not proven my case, you win. The judge can dismiss the case right off the bat. I have the burden of proof. Change the facts. I sue you for custody of your child. You're paranoid schizophrenic. You don't always take your meds. But there's one more fact. The doctor who's treating you says that you have delusions every day because you really don't like the side effects of your antipsychotic medication and you really don't take it. And so your doctor says you can't tell reality from fantasy and you are dangerous in that state. You might think your child is a volleyball and hurl it off a cliff. Okay. 
Does that sound like the child might be in danger? Remember, you have to hold your up, hand up once. Yes? Okay. No? What did you vote? You. Orange shirt. <laughs> dangerous? Not dangerous. 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 Okay. Um, so, in that case, I think I have met my burden of proof. Did I win? Not necessarily. Your lawyer could stand up and say, here's my client's spouse, and your beloved wife or husband gets on the stand and says, I know that my wife is ill. I love my child. I take care of my child by either being with the child myself or our au pair or nanny is there all the time. I never leave my child alone with my wife. My wife loves my, our child. She's great with my child. But I'm not willing to live with that risk, and I'm not asking you to live with that risk. I have taken precautions. Dangerous? Not dangerous? You could go either way, depending on what other evidence comes in, right? The au pair goes to sleep at 11, the mom's still home, the dad's out late working, he's a truck driver. Who knows? But you understand the burden of proof? The default position is the defendant gets to keep what they have or is innocent until proven guilty. That's the burden of proof. The burden of proof being on the government is a tool for justice. And without it, the likelihood of a just outcome is substantially diminished. The other thing I mentioned is the standard of proof, which is a slightly different tool. How strong do your proofs have to be? Well, it depends on how big a right I am taking away from you. That's the third part of the due process test. If the government wants to lock you up, they are basically taking your life away, and they have to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. Have you heard that phrase? Yes. Yeah, everybody knows the criminal stuff. It's so easy. That's why you're taking classes in the child welfare stuff, so you can learn the rest. So beyond a reasonable doubt, and the government has the burden of proof, and some of the jury instructions, and, and Joe's going to correct me if I'm wrong, and Chris, um, sorry, Professor Freed and Professor <laughs> Del Riso, and um, the, the government puts on its case, and the jury goes, oh my gosh, that sounds terrible. But then the defense comes in. And the defense doesn't have to prove that the defendant is innocent. It only has to create reasonable doubt. Could something else reasonably have explained what happened here? And the government has the burden and the standard of proof is beyond a reasonable doubt because what we're taking away from the defendant is his life. So that's a really, really important interest. And I'm a parent, so I don't necessarily agree with this, but in the United States, we seem to think that that is the most important right that people have. Personally, termination of my parent parental rights to my girls, that might be the parental death penalty. But in the United States, that requires a lesser burden of proof, and I can explain why. If you want to take custody away from a parent temporarily, you're paranoid schizophrenic. You don't always take your meds, but you have a history of taking your meds and then not regularly taking your meds, and we need to give you time to stabilize. Maybe your meds' side effects would support a change in the medication regimen. So they change the medication regimen and you get your kid back. That's the hope. So what I'm asking for as the government is the temporary right to take care of your child while we get you stabilized. And that's a very important right, but your child has a contravailing right to be safe. So in the balance of parents' right to the child, child's right to safety, the burden of proof is still on the government but the standard of proof is called preponderance of the evidence. And that means that as the government, 
I don't have to show that it's beyond a reasonable doubt that your child's unsafe. I only have to show it's 51 to 49 and I'm the 51. It's just more than half. So there's a middle tier for when I, the government, want to take your child away from you permanently and free the child for adoption. And that's called clear and convincing evidence. There's no great way that I can explain that except that it's in the middle. The evidence has to be so satisfying that you really are convinced. It's more than 51%, but it's not quite beyond a reasonable doubt. And the reason it's in the middle is because the interest of the parent that's being taken away is in the middle. We're not going to lock you up or execute you, but we're not going to we're trying not to give you back your child ever. So we're going to prove our case clearly and convincingly. And the standard of proof is therefore an important justice tool that without it would create a much less probability of a fair outcome. So those are some of the process tools that courts use when they're trying to figure out what's fair. They make sure that the defendant knows what the case is about. And there are different ways to do that. I mean, some of our defendants, we can't even find them. How do we tell them what the case is about if we can't find them? Should the case, therefore, never be brought? Well, no, because there's different rules about notice. If I know where you are, I either have to hand you the papers, or I have to leave the papers with an adult person who lives in the same house as you. And the, the, the state will then assume that you've gotten notice. Um, but what if you are not English speaking? The judge may order me to serve you a complaint that's not written in English, but rather is written in your native language. There are all kinds of contingencies out there, but you get the basic premise. You have to know what the matter is. Why am I here? How can I defend myself? What can I do to prepare? to answer these charges or allegations. You want to have a hearing. You want to have your say. You don't want to just stand up and not be able to open your mouth. Because then the judge hasn't heard your side. He hasn't heard your explanation. He hasn't heard that your husband makes sure that your child is never alone with you. The judge doesn't even know that. So you need to have your hearing. You need to have a lawyer, otherwise, the prosecutors and deputy attorneys general, and even the lawyer for other, the other civil litigant, you know, your, your husband's lawyer in a divorce situation, may be able to run all over you. It wouldn't be fair. You need a lawyer too. So if the right is important and the government's trying to take it away, the government has to give you a lawyer, even if you can't afford one. So, when we're talking about the tools for justice, due process, the process due, or what you're entitled to, it depends on the weight of the government's interest compared to the weight of the defendant's interest. And you balance them out, and the court figures out what we have to give you in order to be able to defend and how that's going to work to make things fair. Those are the court's tools. So in all termination of parental rights cases, the parents get notice um, and the opportunity to be heard and an attorney and a bench trial where the rules of evidence apply and the state has the burden of proof and the standard of proof is clear and convincing evidence. So when we're talking about these stories, all of those factors apply. And they were applied in all of the stories that we're talking about. But there's some interesting substantive issues, too, about the justice of taking someone's child away when they are not abusive or neglectful. They're just limited. They don't really know enough to parent well enough to have the child be adequately safe. Our law says that we can terminate a parent's rights based on the best interests of the child. So what does that mean? The best
best interests of the child. So maybe we have 50 people in here. I'm guessing if I went around the room and you didn't hear what everybody else was saying, I might get 50 answers. How do you figure out what's in the best interest of the child? And if a parent has a constitutional fundamental right to raise their own child, how do we have judges apply such a loose standard where everybody might have a different opinion? What do we do? Yeah, you have your lawyer, you have your hearing, you have the right to be heard, you have all that good due process, but what should the substantive standard be? The right to conceive and raise one's children have been, dis have been deemed essential, basic civil rights of man, far more precious than property rights. But children have the right to be protected when their physical and mental health is jeopardized. So what do we do when the parent just, they're willing, but they're not able? So the stories, now we get to the stories. In court cases involving children, there are always more than two parties. In criminal case, it's state versus Jones. In the child welfare case, it's state versus Jones in the matter of baby Jones. There's this other little person out there. So it's not the state trying to put somebody in jail where we go beyond a reasonable doubt because it's better to let 10 guilty men go free than put one innocent man behind bars. We have this other little person that we have to take care of. So if we defer too much to the parents' rights by giving them loads and loads of process and an easy burden to meet, then the child may not be protected as the child is entitled to be. How do those rights get sorted out? Well, the courts apply their tools, the law, the Constitution, due process, and we're going to look at these three stories where the state wants to terminate the parental rights of a person with cognitive limitations. Two are real stories, cases I tried, but let's start with a made-up story that many of you have, might have seen in the movies. How can we be so different? Your teacher gave you a, a really hard book this time. What's wrong with your father? Why is he acting like a retard? He is. You're not like other daddies. I'm sorry. Daddy, I'm lucky. Nobody else's daddy ever comes to the park. No one doubts that you love your daughter. These shoes light up. But your intellectual capacity is around that of a seven-year-old. Do we get a balloon with these? Yeah. All of us? Or just her? Our concern is what happens when Lucy turns eight. I find it is not in the best interest of the child to remain in the home, and I order her detained. Why is Lucy going home with me? It's time that you get your own lawyer. This is one of the best ads I've seen in the other pages. You're my lawyer! All right, I'm your okay. lawyer. Okay, we have a lot to go over, and I have five minutes. Ring means go! You're going much faster than everybody else. Is she going to help us? It's always set your dreams high, Lucy. I don't think you realize what you're up against. you got to be firm on this. You have to fight for her. You don't know what it's like when you try and you try and you try and you don't ever get there! I can go at least another nine rounds. You gotta let me in. You think what they think. Sam can't take care of Lucy. It doesn't matter what I think. It matters that we win. It matters to me. Isn't it true that you know you need much more than your daddy can give you? All you need is love. What makes you think you can raise a seven-year-old? Every parent has those moments. A ten-year-old. Moments where the task is so unbelievably challenging. A thirteen-year-old. That you feel retarded. She'll be six years more advanced than you. I wouldn't want any daddy but you. Did you hear that? It's about patience. I worry that I've gotten more out of this than you. And it's about listening. Daddy? I'm here! And it's about love. I am Sam.
You're recording. Hi, this is Sam. It, it's an outgoing message, so I think you need to sound a little more outgoing.
when in real life a child goes into foster care, it usually doesn't turn around in 30 days. It frequently turns around in six months. But sometimes it takes longer. And the child, who may be a newborn when they're placed, grows attached to the people who are taking care of them. So the child's point of view becomes essential to a fair disposition of a case of termination of parental rights or even child abuse neglect where we're just placing a child for the moment. Children have a different sense of time than adults, depending on their age. Some of you have heard me ask this question before, because you've been my students before, but think back to Lucy's seven, okay? Think back to second grade. How long was it between Thanksgiving and Christmas? <laughs> Remember that? It's pretty long. Thanksgiving comes and you're waiting and waiting and waiting. How long is it now? Really fast. <laughs> oh my God, I didn't get the shopping done. And we have the tree put up and we have the company coming. So children have a very different sense of time than adults. And their point of view is very important in determining where they should be. So when we decide these cases, we have to know What's the parent's interest? What's the child's interest? What's the state's interest? So, are there any bad people in this story? Is the judge a bad person? <coughs> no. Trying to do the right thing, right? The foster mom who wants to adopt Lucy, is she a bad person? No. She loves Lucy. She wants to take good care of her. And she does in the movie. You see there's painting and all kinds of fun times together and rolling on the grass with her foster father and it's just, it's happy. The caseworker, the caseworker comes in and they're trying to record like what information do we have here about this relationship between Lucy and her dad? What do I need to do for this? We can close the door. I'll close the door. Close the door. Close the door. is sort of a mantra out there in the community, and we're trying to change that, but there's still a lot of people who think, why on earth would you take that child? This parent's trying as hard as he can. Just help him. Tell him about Nickelodeon. Put something in there. Okay? So how about the attorney from the state? Toby Ziegler, a.k.a. Uh, Richard Schiff is his real name. Um, he's, he's got Sam on the stand, and his job is to make the state's case, to explain to the court and have the court see why this father cannot take care of this child. So he's asking his questions. Is he a bad guy? No. Thank you, because that's me. <laughs> that's what I do. Um, Michelle Pfeiffer gets really pissed at him. This is her first child welfare case. When we see her in the beginning of the movie, she's caroming around in all kinds of expensive suits and cars and getting to court hearings. And Sam comes to talk to her, and she's like, she gives her secretary the eye, like, get him out of here. But she is embarrassed by her colleagues and peers into taking a pro bono case. She's going to represent Sam for free. And so, her secretary calls Sam and says, okay, come back. And that's what you see. You're going to be my lawyer? He's so excited, right? Because his friend found this nice looking ad in the yellow pages. Not a good way to find a lawyer, but okay. Um, 
so Michelle Pfeiffer is yelling at Toby Ziegler and saying, how can you do this? How can you try and take to separate these people? They love each other. What is the matter with you? And he says, you're here now on this one case, but I'm here on lots of cases, and I see what happens when the attempt to put the parent and child together fails, and we get the child back in the system, and it's too late. Is he a bad guy? No. No. Is the caseworker bad? No. The judge isn't bad. Lucy's not bad. Sam's not bad. How do we decide who wins? There's a scene in the movie where Lucy runs away from her foster home, where they want to adopt her. Um, she climbs out the window, climbs down the trellis, has her blanket, runs over to her dad's. He's moved to a few blocks, to within a few blocks, so he can see his child. And um, she wakes up her dad by knocking on the window, and he's like, Lucy, what are you doing here? I want to be with you. So. He knows, he knows enough to know that she can't stay there, and he wraps her in a blanket and brings her back to the adopted home. It happens again the next night, and it happens again the next night. And so there's a clip in the movie, which if I were really good at this, I could have shown you just that clip, where you see the film shots, Lucy running away, brought back. Lucy running away, brought back. Lucy running away, brought back. Fast, 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 fast. She does it again and again and again. The movie goes into fast motion. And for about a minute, you watch Lucy running away back to her dad. So should Lucy decide what should happen to her? Yes. I completely agree. The attachment is an essential piece of evidence that has to be considered if the judge is going to make a fair or just decision at the end. My question was slightly different. Should Lucy decide the outcome? No. Do you remember being seven? <laughs> okay, do you remember being 10, 13, whatever? Um, so, what, what do you know now as adult learners about developmental phases and children and advocacy? Can seven-year-old children be allowed to control the outcome and say where they want to live? Not possible, right? Should the judge know what they want? Yes. Yeah, totally. Should the judge get expert advice about what it will do to this child to be separated from her biological father? Definitely. In the case I was alluding to earlier, where the child has lived with an adoptive family or a foster family for perhaps a year, from age two to age three, or even age six to age seven, and has become attached to that family, should the judge know what the consequence to the child is of losing that new relationship? Yes. Sure. That's all very important evidence. But Lucy, Lucy can't make the decision. So we have this justice system, and we know more about the tools now, and we know more about the laws. In the movie, Lucy is finally allowed to go home to Sam, and in the soccer game that you watched at the end where Sam's riding her around on his shoulders and the kids are following, and you see Michelle Pfeiffer applauding in the bleachers, and if you were 
watching the whole movie, you'd know that the foster family's there, and the next door neighbor's there, and all Sam's friends are there, the ones with the balloons, everybody's there. So it's uh, happy ever after, right? Lucy stays with Sam, and he has this entire support system to wrap around, and sometimes the state can do that. That's what we try to do, wrap a cocoon around a family where there's no malice, but just an inability. And sometimes it works, but not always. And sometimes the parent is not just cognitively limited, but maybe psychotic. And the family that wants to adopt the child does not also want to adopt a mentally ill biological parent. And they decide on behalf of their adopted child who becomes theirs under law that there are going to be severe limitations or no contact allowed between the child and the biological father. And that can happen. In New Jersey, we don't have open adoption, so there's no enforceable right that parents retain. Once their parental rights are terminated, they're at the mercy of the adoptive family. And there's a lot of points of view about that, but um, we won't go there tonight. Um, so, real life. I want to tell you some information about Adrian and Robert, one of the cases I tried. They had six children together. At the time the final court case was decided, which was way after the case started, they had Annette, who was 12, Kimberly, who was 8, Robert Jr., who was 7, Michael, who was 6, Jacob, who died at age 1 from SIDS, and Joseph, an afterborn child who was 2 at the time of the final Supreme Court decision. So the division gets involved in this case because Adrian does have cognitive limitations. She may have surpassed Sam in her mental age, but she, she really had been diagnosed as not having the ability to take care of a child. She thought if you told a two-month-old to stop crying, it would. Um, she was a slight little woman with sort of Coke bottle glasses and bushy hair. But she was working as, a, I think, a home health aide. She had a uniform. She was always neat and presented well, very quiet, very shy. Robert was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. <coughs> Not a good thing if you're trying to make your way in life. A little bit dangerous to live with. So it turns out, as we're getting involved, that Robert and Adrian have Kimberly and Annette at home with them. The others aren't born yet. And there's a lot of domestic violence. It gets really bad. Robert is beating Adrian. So he threatens to kill her with a knife. And she ends up in the hospital a couple of times. So we take Kimberly and, and Annette and place them in a foster home. Because Adrian won't accept services, nor will Robert. We've tried to offer them counseling and other helping, um, other helping forms, but <coughs> they reject all efforts and don't want to have anything to do with the agency. They just want their kids back, their daughters. So after Adrian lands in the hospital the second time, we place the girls with their foster mother. And they live there for a long number of years. They call her grandma. So they know that this is not their mother, but that's who they're attached to. That's who provides for their basic needs. That's who provides them with stability. That's who provides them with guidance and nurture. And they visit with their parents on a supervised basis under the watchful eye, maybe behind the glass, maybe in the room, of their caseworker. So Adrian and Robert go on. Adrian decides she's going to marry Robert. 
she and Robert have Robert Jr., they have Michael, they have Jacob. The case is open with the division. <laughs> Jacob dies. And we don't know why. Because you don't know right away. And we have a preliminary hearing. You saw one in the clip where the judge says, what I know so far, I can't leave these boys home. Because this baby died, and I don't know why. So I'm taking Robert and Michael, and I'm placing them in foster care. Services are offered, sketchy acceptance, visits go on. Robert and Michael have never lived with Kimberly and Annette because they were in placement before Robert and Michael were born. But they visit together, and they know each other as siblings. And Adrian and Robert make another baby, Joseph. And we still don't know why, when Joseph is delivered, why Jacob died. So Joseph goes into foster care when he's born. And eventually, the division files a complaint for termination of parental rights. So here's poor Adrian. She's cognitively limited. She's the victim of domestic violence. She's basically where Sam was in not understanding why this is happening. Why don't my children come home with me? She has a lawyer. She has hearings. And this was a long time ago, so we had a slightly different, not as good justice system for parents, which is why this stretched out for so long. Now the rules require speedier dispositions, but at the time we were kind of going back to court and back to court. Every three months I would go to court and I would tell the judge, the kids are fine, the parents are doing some, but they are really no better than they started out. Um, and one day we get a new judge. And I am like, 26 years old, it's my first year practicing law, and I go to court, and there's this new judge. And I make my same old, you know, statement about what's happening, and the judge says, I don't see why you have these children in placement. I think they should go home. And I was like, what? Wait, no. I, I, I didn't have notice. Right? Remember notice? I'm surprised. What am I supposed to do now? So I call my supervisor. She's like, well, put on some evidence. So we start a hearing. Remember the right to hearing? I'm like, I need a hearing. So it's Thursday afternoon, kind of late. So I put the caseworker who's with me on the stand, and she describes what's going on sort of now, because that's what she knows, because she's the now caseworker. But I haven't had time to gather the evidence of why these kids entered placement in the first place. I have some documents, but at the time they're like handwritten contact sheets. Reading them is torture. So I don't know if the judge read them or he didn't read them. But the next day I bring in some more witnesses. I bring in um, an expert to testify about Adrian's cognitive limitations and Robert's mental illness. But the judge at the end of Friday, 4 p.m. court day, and I'm in the middle of my hearing, says, I'm ordering these children home tonight. Oh, no. Okay, so um, just to finish my story, I'm, um, we run back to the office. We're preparing papers. We want to go to the appellate division. These kids can't go home tonight. They, they haven't lived home in years. Um, Adrian's no better. Robert's no different. What are we talking about here? And it's the weekend. Like, we don't, we have people on call all the time, but we don't have a caseworker to, like, sit in this house all weekend and make sure the children are safe. So, the trial court's theory was the most that can be said of these parents and children is that they are the victims of cultural and financial deprivation. Well, they were the victims of financial and cultural deprivation. And we can project in all our own minds the images of what a poor home looks like and what a not poor home looks like. 
right? And they're different. So this judge said, well, these kids, these boys are developmentally delayed, and but, but Jacob wasn't killed by these parents. By now we know it was Sid's death. It was nothing to do with these parents. This child could have been the Prince of England. He still would have died. That's what Sid's is. And what do we do when parents are so poor that they can't afford the minimum adequate stuff for kids? And the answer to that question, just in case you were wondering, is we give them what they need. Being poor is not neglect. You can't be poor as the only problem and be found neglectful to allow the state to take your children away from you. That is not allowed under law. Good. That's justice, right? But that wasn't the only problem here. Part of the problem was Adrian. Robert thought Adrian should take complete care of the children. And we knew that Adrian couldn't. So we go to the appellate division. We, we end up in the New Jersey Supreme Court. And we come to another judicial tool, which is interpretation of the laws. We talked a while back about best interests of the child and the fact that 50 of us might have 50 different interpretations of what that means. But in this case about Adrian and Robert, the Supreme Court wrote a lot of very interesting stuff. And they set forth a definition of best interest of the child that would pass constitutional muster. And by that I mean the parents have a fundamental constitutional right to raise their own children. So we can't just take them because we think it's a good idea. That we think the child's best interests require it. So what should the government's burden be? Well, we know that the burden of proof is clear and convincing. But what does best interest mean? And the court gave some clear guidelines. And it's not that you have to know these guidelines, but I'm going to tell you about them because it's to show the difference between a vague statute that says best interest of the child and a court interpretation, a judicial tool that gives clearer guidance so that if we have 50 judges deciding 50 cases, you can tell why they came out the way they did besides saying, well, that was Judge Brown and this was Judge Jones. Good idea, right? So judicial interpretation is another judicial tool. So in this case, they said that the best interest of the child requires that the government prove clearly and convincingly that the health and development of the child will be impaired or has been impaired by the parental relationship. That's a clearer thing to try and figure out than what's the best interest of the child. You also have to prove that the parents are unable or unwilling to eliminate the harm and that the delay of permanency, adoption after termination of parental rights, the delay will cause further harm. So that's easier to understand than best interest of the child. And it's interesting because they can be unable, like Adrian, or just unwilling. Robert, it so happens, stopped caring about his daughters. He said, you can keep the girls. That's a quote but I want my sons back. So that's factual evidence that we can now apply to this case law to understand what a just outcome could be. We have an interpretation. In order not to um, inappropriately move against poor people, we have a third prong to our test which is that the state has to make reasonable efforts to get the child back home. So we have to help the parent. We have to give a first month's rent and a security deposit, or we have to give drug treatment, or we have to give 
visiting nurse services, or we have to give homemaker services, or we have to give caseworker visits, or family preservation, or any one of a host of things that the state can offer that will prevent the child from having to go through termination of parental rights and adoption, and will prevent the parent's loss of that child. We have to make reasonable efforts. The last prong is that termination will not do more harm than good, which simply refers to the fact that children need a parent. And if you're not going to be able to get the child adopted because they don't want to be adopted, they're 17 and they're done, or because and I, I honestly don't know any of these. We, we get so many kids adopted. It's so impressive. But some children are difficult to place, and the court might be convinced that we're going to have too hard a time finding a family. And so the court might conclude, you're never going to get this kid adopted. I'm not going to terminate parental rights, because if we do that, they don't even have their biological parents. And we know they're not going to get adoptive parents, so we're not doing that termination in that case would do more harm than good. So those are the four prongs to the best interest standard. And that judicial interpretation is used to make sure that there's a just outcome in a case like this. Let's talk about the last story. Unless you want to vote on Adrian and Robert. Who thinks that they should forfeit their parental rights and let the children be adopted by their foster parents. You have to vote one way or the other. Let's see your hands. Is that it? Okay. The rest of you, raise your hand. You believe that the children should not be removed from these parents forever. Well, they got services. Remember, I told you that was part of the story, right? We tried to get services, and they declined and rejected. So they never got better. Adrian stayed the same. Robert stayed the same. You want to vote again? Yes. Yeah. All right. How many people think that Adrian and Robert should forfeit their children to allow them to be, all five, all five surviving children to be adopted? All right. Will you agree with the Supreme Court? I ended up winning. And all the kids were adopted. Um, so, on to the next story. And we're going to move a little bit more quickly through that one and then wrap up. So, the next story is about Lori, the mom, and Sarah. And Lori is in the mentally retarded range. She has a lot of trouble figuring out the world. And she lives, Lori's the mom, she lives in a supportive um, situation, so she manages her own life. She has a job. She can take care of herself. She's attractive and, you know, well-dressed as she can be, given her means. Her hair is always neatly back in a ponytail. She comes to court properly dressed. She's attentive. She listens. Um, and she has great lawyers from the Community Mental Health Law Project. She understands what the case is about. But the case started when Lori went to the hospital with a stomach ache and delivered a baby. So Lori went through a nine month pregnancy without understanding that she was pregnant. So once I became pregnant, which was after I tried this case, <laughs> that was even harder for me to understand. Lori was a little bit um, obese, but not terribly. And you think there's going to be a shape change. But if you've ever been pregnant, I mean, my experience being pregnant was my sense of smell changed, my eyesight changed, my feet got bigger. There were a lot of functions that I had to perform that felt different. Um, and it was I was tired. I felt really different when I was pregnant. And I was really happy. I was also really sick. But I was really happy. But I knew I was pregnant. Lori did not know. 
so she delivers this baby and she names her Sarah. And Sarah is perfectly healthy, except as she grows older, it's clear that she has a serious asthmatic condition. And it's clear that Lori can't take care of her. So Sarah goes into a wonderful foster home with a married couple and their other child. And eventually that couple is looking to adopt Sarah. But Lori's not Adrian and Robert. Lori is cooperative, she's trying, she goes to everything we send her to, but she never gets to the point where our doctor, who is chosen by Lori's lawyers, our psychologist is chosen by Lori's lawyers because he's an advocate for mentally retarded individuals. He does an assessment and he says, you cannot safely leave a child alone with Lori, especially this child. And during the trial, I bring in the foster father, which I don't usually do. And he explains what it takes to take care of Sarah's asthma. They have a nebulizer. They have emergency stuff. They have to watch the color of her skin in comparison to the color of her lips. They have to listen to her breathing. They have to have a monitor at her bed because she really can go off. Her triggers are multiple and she can go off and she could die. This is not like, oh, I can't breathe right now, I can't play gym. This is, she could die. So we have this trial, and it goes really long. So the judge asks all of us, look, it's been 18 days of trial. I don't have a lot more time I can give you. Is it okay if we stay late? So we all say, we look at each other and we're like, okay, as long as we get a dinner break. So we get our dinner break, and the first night we stay till 8 p.m., which is a really long trial day because trial day is like, you're on, like you've got adrenaline, right? And poor Lori, you know, this is her life, this is her child. Her life's at stake here. But we stay till 8 p.m., we all go home. We come back on the next trial day, which was not the next day, and we stay till 11 p.m. We start at 9, we have a mid-morning break of 10 minutes, we have an hour break for lunch, we have a mid-afternoon break of 10 minutes, we have a 4 p.m. break for 10 minutes, we have a 6 p.m. hour-long dinner break, we come back, we've got an expert on the stand. Lori's trial team has hired another expert, and she says, Lori can do this if you give her enough support. That's her opinion. But we want to finish with this expert. Poor thing, she's been on the stand and we don't want her to have to come back. And so it gets to be eight and it gets to be nine and it gets to be 10 and it gets to be 11 and the expert finishes testifying. <laughs> We're back in court the next day. We're tired. Judge lets us have coffee on the bench. So, um, the sheriff's officer, this is a guy in the uniform who protects the judge from crazy people who might be in the courthouse, um, asks Lori in the hallway, Howley, did you stay last night? And Lori says, we stayed till six. And the sheriff's officer says to me, why is everyone so tired if you got to go home at six? And I said, we didn't go home at six, we stayed till 11. And he says, but Lori told me to stay till 6. And I'm thinking, I roll with this. Judge, can I put your sheriff's officer on the stand? Is this important information? Yeah, I, I think it's important. I'm not being mean. Me and Toby Ziegler, we're in the same club, right? I think Sarah cannot go home to Lori. And I think that this is something that the judge needs to know in order to decide fairly what should happen. And so I put the sheriff's officer on the stand, sheriff's officer on the stand, and he gives his testimony. And um, in his opinion, terminating parental rights, this judge 
says, you know, on direct examination, Miss, Miss, I can't say her last name, Lori presented very nicely. You know, she, she said great stuff. She was intelligent sounding, and she knew what to say, and she knew the answers. But on cross-examination and other testimony, it became clear to me that she really could not take care of this child. And so, using all the due process tools, the interpretation of the law given by the Supreme Court, and applying these facts to this objective standard, or as objective as it can be, I find that the best interests of Sarah require that she be adopted by her foster family and not returned to Lori. So, it's really sad, right? Is Lori a bad person? No. Am I a bad person? Be careful what you say. <laughs> no. But the facts allowed the government to achieve a just result. Lori had a team of two lawyers. She knew what was going on. We tried to help her, and she complied. But compliance isn't success. And at a certain point, if you have to make a decision that either the parent or the child is going to have to suffer, you have to choose the child's benefit. You have to. They have to grow up. Interestingly, during the course of this trial, the superintendent of schools of the city of New York by name Green, died of an asthma attack. And I always thought that that sort of helped me, because even though the record is only what's in evidence before the judge, people are human. And if the front page has on it that somebody just died of asthma, and you've just been listening to this child's near fatal, you know, potential with her disease, then maybe that affects you too. So, our perceptions govern our thinking and in determining what's right. Fifty of us could decide fifty different things. The tools we use to resolve those disputes depend on our training and experience. To judges, the tools and experience are to process all the things we talked about, the laws, the constitutional privileges. That's their hammer. In our justice system, laws reflect what our priorities are. The Constitution protects our fundamental rights. The courts use judicial tools to make the process fair. And now you know what some of them are. Well, what's fair? I leave that to you. But as you go out into the world to protect children and families powered by your passion to help them, Strap on your tool belts, because the halls of justice require the hammers of justice. Build well. Thank you. Um, my guys, you all have to sign my, my sheet. Some of you are in two classes.